Well, welcome, everyone. I'm sure people are going to log in um, as we speak in the next you know, minute or so. Um, welcome on behalf of the Humanities Research Fellowship for the Study of the Arab World to another uh, webinar that we are yet again hosting um, together with the Arab Crossroads Studies Program. We're very, very happy to welcome you to this uh, format. I think it's the third event that we're pioneering in that particular remote format this um, semester, uh, always following the usual format, an hour long, um, and I'm usually the one who speaks the least, which is, I think, much appreciated. So my role is only to say welcome and then pass it on to the speaker, as well as the person introducing and moderating today's event. So our speaker today is Sarah Persley, dear colleague from NYU New York, and our moderator today is Jonathan Shannon, visiting professor at NYU Abu Dhabi and associate dean in the arts and humanities. So thanks so much for joining both of you, and I hope we have a wonderful hour. Thank you, Martin, and good afternoon or good morning or good evening uh, to the attendees. And welcome to this inaugural uh, webinar or seminar for the Arab Crossroads Studies lunchtime lecture series. We wish we could uh, invite you for a lunch around our seminar table. That will have to wait for another semester. I'm really happy to welcome Sarah Persley around our virtual table. We had initially planned to have her speak to us uh, last spring, uh, but uh, circumstances prevented that. So it's my pleasure to welcome her um, today. Uh, Sarah Persley, as Martin pointed out, is an assistant professor um, at New York University in the Square. Uh, prior to that, uh, she had uh, teaching appointments at Princeton University, uh, the CUNY Graduate Center in Queens College of CUNY, where uh, at the Graduate Center is where she did her PhD work and where we were colleagues for a brief period of time. Uh, Sarah is an expert on the intellectual history of the modern Arab world with a special focus on culture and society in Iraq. Uh, she's focused particularly on the mid 20th century history uh, the age of so-called global development and has a strong interest in economic development and modernization theory, uh, theories of pedagogy, uh, gender and sexuality, and uh, a number of other issues related to secularism and religion, and land settlement, uh, and questions of empire that will be interesting to many of our, our faculty uh, and students as well. She's here to present work on her forthcoming book, um, uh, Familiar Futures, Time, Selfhood, and Sovereignty in Iraq, which is um, the contract with Stanford University Press, which as we know is a leading press uh, in, in, uh, in Middle East studies today. Uh, this work as we will explore uh, together, uh, looks at various understandings of time and selfhood, secular and Islamic, and how they shaped interventions um, into the lives of Iraqis uh, under the name of development. Um, I will be taking questions to the Q&A button, which attendees can see at the bottom of their Zoom screen. And uh, at the end of Sarah's uh, extraordinary presentation, um, I will field those to her and let her uh, respond. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Sarah, for, for joining us today. Thanks very much, uh, Jonathan and Martin. And uh, I wanna thank Huma also for inviting me um, to this um, originally and um, everyone uh, who's, who's done a great job uh, coordinating it, Raya and Alex and, um, and uh, Martin and Monica. Um, uh, so um, I'm going to talk about my book. The book is actually out uh, uh, from Stanford. It's called uh, Familiar Futures, as Jonathan said, Familiar Futures, Time, Selfhood, and Sovereignty um, in Iraq. And I'm actually going to do uh, a little bit differently than, than I've been doing uh, book talks, partly just because I don't want to keep giving the same book talk. Um, but also, I want to sort of return to um, to two American interventions um, in Iraq, uh, minor interventions, not, not military invasions. Obviously there's two of those we could talk about um, also, uh, but I'm looking at an earlier time period. Um, so interventions by American experts, education experts in particular um, in Iraq in 1932 and 1952. I do talk about these um, in my book, um, but they're not the main way I frame my argument. Um, I think, you know, honestly, I'm a little preoccupied with what's going on in the US right now. Uh, so some of these uh, questions are on my mind. Um, and also, I think it might just be sort of a straightforward way to try to introduce uh, what I see as my main argument um, to you and uh, think about um, the different uh, meanings or what I say in the book registers for the title of the book, Familiar Futures, um, as a way to get at my um, argument. So I'm not just going to read from a paper, because that uh, seems even weirder on Zoom than, than regularly, but I do have um, some notes. And I am mainly going to talk. I do have some slides, um, but probably uh, most of those I'm just kind of saving for, for issues that may come up um, in the Q&A. Um, so in 1932, uh, a team of American educators um, arrived in Iraq um, on the invitation of the 
uh, Iraqi Hashemite uh, monarchy. Iraq had just become formally independent and joined the League of Nations. The Iraqi government was thinking about um, how to, um, um, you know, align this political state, their political state with the semi-independent uh, status it now had, and also uh, was responding to the global economic depression, which was playing out in Iraq as uh, mainly as an agrarian crisis, um, driving uh, many rural people to the cities and, and so on. So they invited this team of experts from uh, Teachers College of Columbia University. Um, it was called the Monroe Commission um, um, after the name of the director of the commission, Paul Monroe, who at the time was a well-known um, American um, educational uh, theorist um, and several other uh, professors at Teachers College of uh, Columbia. Uh, so they were influenced by a number of American educational philosophies, and I'll talk about some of the other ones um, in a minute, but the main kind of framework was, uh, was pragmatism, um, so the, the, the philosophy associated uh, with John Dewey, who also taught at Teachers College of Columbia University until 1929, I think he retired, so just before this, um, this commission. So the, the central terms they were using were, were um, education for real life, learning by doing, the child-centered curriculum. These were the central kind of keywords or concepts of pragmatism that they then applied in particular ways um, to um, Iraqi society and to the Iraqi um, education system. I could discuss in the Q&A if you're interested whether I think this is a use or a misuse of pragmatism I'm more associated with Dewey. I do have some opinions about that, um, but I'll leave that aside for, for right now. The main critique uh, these experts made of the Iraqi school system was that it was, um, the curriculum was the same for all Iraqi children um, across the kingdom. Um, and here's a quote from the report. Um, they, uh, they criticized the, the curriculum for being quote, uniform for all schools, whether urban or rural, whether boys schools or girls schools throughout the kingdom, end quote. So these, in this quote, you get the two main differences that this commission was focused on the urban rural difference and the male female difference. So what they argued was that girls in Iraq, this is one of the interesting things about Iraqi history um, that I look at is that in 1932, girls and boys in Iraq um, had the same education. They were segregated in separate schools, but they followed the same official curriculum, the same examinations. Officially, the curriculum was the same uh, for girls and boys. The Americans arrived and said, no, 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 you can't be, you can't be teaching girls and boys the same, um, you can't be giving them the same education. Girls need to be studying home economics for a significant amount of time they're spending um, in school. So that was one of their uh, primary critiques. The other main critique was that um, urban boys and rural boys were getting the same education. And they said rural boys, which of course was the majority of Iraqis at the time, need to be trained in uh, manual labor, agricultural skills, um, and we don't wanna give them ideas that might encourage them to move to the cities that might give them ambitions that the economy um, can't support. So those were the main um, critiques. Um, so uh, this focus on home economics, which you know, in the United States in 1932, home economics was a required field of study for all girls um, in American public um, education. Um, and uh, home economics, for those of you who don't know, uh, focused on uh, teaching girls, uh, you know, home management skills, household budgeting, cleaning, cooking, um, raising children, health and hygiene, child psychology, you know, all, all skills associated with being a mother um, and a housewife. So this is the first meaning of my book's title, Familiar Futures. It refers to the centrality of ideas about family life, about uh, gender roles, about childhood and raising um, uh, uh, certain kinds of children for um, ideas about modern uh, futures and especially economically developed uh, futures because the Monroe Report was specifically arguing um, that these uh, reforms were necessary for, to quote the report, um, the economic development of Iraq's natural resources and the development of a national consciousness among its youth. And one of the things my book is doing is looking at the coming together of different concepts of development um, in the interwar period that by 1945 would coalesce into the post-war concept of economic development. So that's the first meaning of familiar uh, futures or what I call the first register um, of, of the title um, um, as I intend it. Um, I'm actually giving it in a different order than I do in the introduction of the book. Uh, so we'll see how this goes. Um, the other, uh, um, You know, what, what I argue then to get to these other uh, registers is that if we look, um, if we consider uh, the um, concepts of, of temporality or of time um, that um, are manifested in a lot of these modernization and economic development discourses, specifically in relation to ideas about gender, family, and childhood, 
that um, ha has helped me sort of explore paradoxical um, aspects of modern conceptions of time uh, more broadly. Uh, so to give you a really concrete example of this, um, and also to get to the second two meanings of familiar futures, um, I can return to the uh, Monroe report um, and look at how um, the, two, the two concepts of familiar futures I'm gonna talk about now are, they seem to be paradoxical, but I actually think there's a really close relation between them. So on the one hand, uh, the report's recommendations on girls' education, girls need to study home economics, recall, recalls Uday Singh Mehta's analysis of the futuristic orientation of liberal discourse in relation to European imperial power over the non-European world. So I don't wanna throw long uh, theoretical quotes at you, so I am gonna bring up a slide um, here to share the screen. So this is a quote from, uh, from Uday, Singh, uh, Uday Singh Mehta's book, Liberalism and Empire. He's talking about liberal discourse and its role in, um, in imperialism and uh, European imperial power. And he asks, but what is the perspective from which experience appears irredeemably provisional and incomplete? It is one in which experience is always viewed and assessed from a future point. It is on account of this futural perspective that one can know or claim to know the experience's future history, its process of gestation into another stage of life. So what I think is especially interesting about this Monroe Commission when they arrive in, um, in Iraq um, and they have what seems to us maybe like a counterintuitive understanding of the relation of gender to modernity when they say you can't be giving girls and boys the same education if you, if you wanna modernize, if you want a developed future, you need to be teaching girls home economics is this incredible confidence they had that they knew what Iraq's future looked like uh, because it was intimately familiar to them as their own present, right? Iraq's future was the current present moment um, of the United States. It never occurred to them that uh, compulsory home economics education for girls might just be a stage the United States was passing through, you know, on its way toward less knowable modern futures. They were just absolutely certain that their present was Iraq's uh, future and was the future that Iraq um, should be desiring, should be moving. Um, towards. So that's my second meaning of familiar futures, is the future that's familiar because we all know what it looks like. It looks like the, the present of the West, in this case of the United States in 1932. Then the third meaning of the term uh, familiar futures, um, also uh, we can return to the Monroe um, report. Actually, I'm just gonna read from page 80 um, of, of my book for a, just a few sentences. This is all from chapter three um, of the book. So on the other hand, after I just discussed uh, that, familiar futures as the future we all know about, it's the future of the industrialized West. On the other hand, the Monroe Commission was clear that Iraq's future might and indeed should look very different from the present of the United States. As some Iraqi critics observed, the report said almost nothing about industrialization, for example, while it had a great deal to say about the importance of keeping rural Iraqis in rural areas, including by cultivating their desires for agricultural labor, quote, which has always been the chief means of support of the people of this ancient land, end quote. So this was a recurring, um, a recurring uh, theme of development experts in Iraq, uh, British uh, advisors, American advisors, and then the post-World uh, War II development teams that came to Iraq, the World Bank, the FAO, UNESCO, um, as well as you know, many Iraqi officials, um, we hear this discourse that um, Iraq has always been an agricultural country, will remain an agricultural country. So development projects were often about um, keeping rural people in rural areas um, and, and encouraging them not to migrate to the cities. In this case, with the Monroe Commission, the ideas that they brought um, to implement this in the Iraqi school system were taken from the Hampton and Tuskegee Institutes um, in the American South. Um, so it was this theory called adapted education, which was related to a theory called industrial education. Adapted education was the theory that education systems needed to be adapted to the uh, stage of development of the community in which a school um, existed. 
So it was used to uh, justify uh, the continuation of segregated schooling projects um, in the American South for black youth. Um, and it came directly from the Hampton and Tuskegee Institutes. There was actually a very close connection between Columbia Teachers College and Hampton and Tuskegee, which is often forgotten um, in the scholarship on the history of Columbia Teachers College, which is more associated with kind of democratizing um, impulses in education. And in fact, the Monroe Report has been described in that way in uh, most of the Iraqi scholarship, that it was promoting democracy in, in Iraqi education, that it was expanding educational opportunities to people of all classes. Um, what it was doing was bringing this racialized, um, highly uneven um, theory of education, which was related to a racialized, uneven theory of economic development um, to Iraq. So when, when the Monroe uh, Commission, and, and, and by the way, one of the experts um, on the Monroe Commission besides Paul Monroe was this guy named um, Edgar, Al uh, Edgar Wallace Knight who was a, a well-known uh, proponent in the United States of segregated schooling, of the disenfranchisement of black Americans, of Jim Crow laws. Um, so he was bringing that um, to Iraq um, in order to try to implement this um, education system that would be segregated based on rural and urban location as well as on class. And there also are ideas about race in here about having an Arab curriculum, a Kurdish curriculum and so on. I could say more um, about that. What Paul Monroe said, who was kind of supposed to be the more liberal democratic uh, um, 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 representative on this commission, um, he spoke explicitly against the Americanization of education in Iraq. Um, and what he meant by that, uh, he said explicitly, we don't want to create schools, um, New England type schools in, um, in Iraq. What they wanted was to create Tuskegee-like schools in Iraq. So it was a particular kind of Americanization against this, this racialized, uneven um, pattern of, of both education and, um, and development. So in this uh, register or meaning of my book's title, Iraqi futures were familiar because they kept looking stubbornly like what they were supposed to have relegated to the past, at least according to the universalizing uh, uh, narrative of modernization. Uh, namely economies oriented largely toward the production of agriculture, agricultural and other raw materials for industrialization located elsewhere. So trying to maintain Iraq in its current location um, in the global economy. So, you know, I'd say uh, for the main, uh, one of the main wagers of my book is that these three registers of familiar futures. So familiar as familial and also as intimate as having to do with family life and creating particular kinds of children. Familiar as familial, familiar as the West, and familiar as a repetition of Iraq's present, those three registers can be thought together in analytically uh, productive ways. And one thing I argue in particular throughout the book is that analytical attention to the role of gender difference in the production of modernity opens up some of these paradoxes that are intrinsic to modern conceptions of time uh, more broadly, and especially in the context of, of economic um, development. Okay, so I'm gonna say a few things. I'm just gonna talk 10 more minutes. I'm not gonna take up more than 30 minutes total. Um, but I, I'll say a few things about um, uh, the second American intervention that I mentioned um, in 1952. So 20 years later after the Monroe Report, and by the way, the Iraqi, edu the Iraqi education system implemented the recommendations on girls' education in particular. So over the next two decades, the education system was increasingly differentiated on the basis of sex, where girls were required to take, uh, spend more and more of their school time um, taking required home economics courses. The, the recommendations in agriculture were more, um, were more debated. So they would get implemented, but then there would be pushback. And, and so those were a little more controversial. The girls' education ones were also controversial, especially in secondary schools, um, but they did get um, implemented uh, in primary schools, especially up to 1952. In 1952, another American arrives in Iraq. Her name was Ava Milam, and she, uh, with a team, and she was um, a um, she was the dean of the School of, of Domestic Science and Arts, meaning home economics, at um, Oregon Agricultural College. And the Iraqi government, she arrived as part of a team um, with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. So it was an FAO team um, headed by Ava Milam to evaluate girls' education um, in Iraq. So she toured the girls' education system and then wrote this report. And she basically repeated the Monroe Report's recommendations from 20 years earlier. She actually just repeated it, I mean, almost verbatim, but without citing it, um, um, as if nothing had changed in that time. In fact, um, all girls by then in Iraq school system were required to take home economics. Um, but she recommended a, dra a dramatic increase in the time devoted to home economics, especially for, for girls in secondary schools. She recommended they be required to study home economics for 20% of the time they spent um, in school. 
um, including in preparatory schools where girls were trying to prepare for college and trying to prepare for examinations um, in competition with boys who did not have similar requirements. So there was some pushback in Iraq around this. There was some debate around it, um, but they did start to implement it before it was interrupted by the 1958 um, revolution. Um, so one of the uh, remarkable things about Eva Milam's visit is she wrote, writes this report in 1952 um, saying girls should spend 20% of their time um, in home economics. Um, and she, then she wrote this memoir in 1969 uh, to an American audience in which she suggested that what she had done in 1952 was try to expand academic educational opportunities for Iraqi women. She said when she arrived there, um, she and the women she worked with, the Iraqi women she worked with faced violent opposition from conservative male officials who opposed teaching political science to girls. So she's suggesting she was promoting the expansion of teaching political science to girls, which was the exact opposite of what she'd actually recommended in the 1952 report, which was to reduce the study of political science, reduce the study of academic subjects in general, and expand um, home economics requirements. The main reason I'm bringing this up is just to, um, you know, to point out that what happened in the meantime between 1952 and 1969 um, was that was the second wave feminist movement in the United States, right, where home economics was no longer considered a marker and an index of modernity. It was now considered a modern uh, a marker, an index of backwardness, right? And, and three years after that, in 1972, um, Title IX would be passed. Um, which would ban, which would make illegal um, sex-based uh, sex -based, uh, educational requirements in public schools, which would make home economics requirements for girls um, illegal. Um, so my point here is that between 1952 and 1969, you know, neither, um, neither uh, the use of women's status to index a nation's modernity, um, nor the, the relative locations of Iraq and the US um, in that uh, sort of resulting a temporal spatial map of the world, neither of those things had changed. What had changed were American conceptions of progress and modernity. So she had to try to reverse her narrative exactly, even though it was actually just a lie in relation to what she had recommended in 1952. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, these ideas of, of modernization and of gender and of women's equality, um, you know, continue to influence the scholarship as well as of race. You know, I mean, everyone knows that in the 1930s, the United States was, was a, a, a country society, you know, founded on racism, built on racism. Um, yet when, when scholars uh, look at um, the export of American ideas abroad, they still tend to see this as um, a democratizing, um, equalizing um, impulse. So I'm really trying to put Iraq, you know, in the US in the same frame and the same time period and look at the traveling of some of these um, concepts as well as of course the unequal um, power um, relationships. So I, uh, I didn't think I'd get to many slides and I didn't, but I will just spend a few minutes um, sort of uh, just pointing uh, towards kind of where, where, this, where this is going. This is in one of the early chapters, that chapters three and four, I look at those two American interventions. And they're just a small part of the story. They're not the main event. Um, the main, uh, the, the last uh, two chapters and three, if you count the epilogue of the book, focus on the Iraqi revolution of 1958. And what I'm really interested in here, as throughout the book, is um, some of the, the paradoxes between uh, mobility and immobility, change and stagnation um, in modernization and development projects, and then in a revolutionary discourse around the 1958 um, revolution. And I'm especially interested in this revolutionary era in how um, all of the, the four political parties that supported the revolution, which was the, the Iraqi Communist Party, the Ba'ath Party, um, the Independence Party, which was another Arab Nationalist Party, and the Liberal Democratic Party, which was like a liberal, you know, liberal democratic bourgeois party. Um, all four of them um, uh, that even though they were fighting really seriously over major issues, and the Ba'athists Bath and the communists were killing each other in the streets by the end of the revolutionary era. Um, they, there was a widespread consensus around um, the revolution's main goal as economic development, um, understood in a particular way, and they agreed um, to, to a significant extent on how it was understood, even the communists and the liberals, um, and the need for the government to intervene in the intimate lives of Iraqi subjects, of Iraqi citizens, in order to produce economic development, and all of the parties were uh, willing to, with a few individual exceptions of actual individuals, but the parties themselves were willing to sacrifice um, what, or, or to postpone, to defer what they themselves defined as their main political goal. Um, the liberal Democrats, a, a liberal democracy, um, the communists, at least, uh, you know, they're, they're, I mean, 
they had a two stage revolution thing so they could sort of separate these goals. But ultimately, you know, they wanted a socialist society. The two Arab nationalist parties, of course, wanted Arab Union. All of them, to some extent or another, were willing to, to suspend or defer those goals. And none of, none of those goals were ever achieved. So none of the parties ever achieved uh, what, they, what they described as their main goal in Iraq, not in, not in 1958 and not ever. Um, for this idea of economic um, development, which in many ways was, um, so on the one hand, the political goals are deferred in the name of economic development. On the other hand, even economic development in many ways is constantly deferred. So one of the things I look at is um, the role of ideas about children, about the family, um, in these projects of perpetual deferral of certain political goals. And I don't mean that people made some rational choice if they could have made some different choice. You know, obviously there's all kinds of factors going on here, but I am looking at this um, a deep kind of commitment to asking a military regime to intervene in people's personal lives, even among parties who in theory supported democracy um, were against military rule. And I really wanna look at the role and it's just one factor of course, but the role of um, this um, willingness to ask the military government to intervene in people's lives to um, the perpetual deferral of their political goals. On the other hand, and I'll just pull up a slide real quickly here, I got two minutes left. Um, I also look uh, in the book, and this is really in the epilogue, but, but throughout the book, I also look at ways in which um, Iraqi nationalist uh, narratives or Iraqi nationalist imaginaries um, contested and disrupted um, what I consider to be this linear modernization narrative that appears to be yearning for this change, yearning for change, yearning for a changed future, but ends up constantly deferring the change that it says it's yearning for, which is my critique of, of the linear modernization narrative throughout the book. Um, and one of the ways in which they challenged it was by drawing on um, um, Iraqi and or Islamic, or different kinds of local understandings of time and temporality that did not end in a single universal fixed uh, future, like the kind the Monroe Commission had in mind as their own uh, present. So this is a well-known uh, monument, the Monument to Freedom by the famous Iraqi artist Shawad Salim. And it's usually read uh, from right to left, like a line of Arabic text. So it starts with um, some kind of uprising here, maybe the 1920 revolt against the British occupation. This gets read in different ways. There's many historical scenes um, in here. Um, the nationalist movement um, up to the revolution of 1958, and then this uh, peaceful, prosperous and developed future. That's the main way of reading um, the Monument to Freedom. Um, I started getting obsessed with uh, different Iraqi um, uh, art critics writing in Arabic about this monument, which they've done in a really interesting way for decades, about different ways we can understand its depictions of um, time. Um, we can see it, for example, as, as not this linear narrative, but as a, um, a circular narrative, where this is this, the revolution is the center and the past and the future. You can see this whole thing as a spoke of a wheel or rotating around the, the revolution. Um, you can read um, uh, narratives uh, reminiscent of Ibn Khaldun in here, where tribal, um, tribal uh, rebels overthrow a civilization and it advances up to a certain point, and then the thing gets repeated. Um, so in some ways this was building on, and I look at other um, Iraqis um, who are thinking in this way of this sort of uh, um, ideas of cyclical or repetitive history that would actually allow for repeated revolutions rather than this future that is um, a static and constantly deferred. So I have a lot more I could say about this monument and I do have some more slides, but I just wanted to gesture at um, actually what I call the fourth register of familiar futures, which is futures that are familiar because they have some connection to the present and they might actually be realizable. Um, so this I'm looking more positively at uh, different kinds of futures people were trying to imagine that did not have this problem of um, perpetual deferral. So I'm going to stop there and uh, open it up to comments, questions. Oops. Oh, well, well, might as well. I got you on here now. I don't know if you can still see. Um, that's uh, the Monument to Freedom uh, recently in one of the protests that's been happening, or maybe it was a year ago, um, in Iraq um, at the time. So that's the monument in its uh, context. Could you still see that? Was I still sharing? No, I'm yeah. lost. Okay, great. I see what happened, okay. All right. Wonderful, thank you so much, Sarah. That was excellent. And I think um, participants, if they had the button to show the applause icon, they'd be doing it en masse. Uh, that was fabulous. I just wanna take a moment, uh, not only to thank you for that excellent talk, but uh, to remind our, our audience members that I misspoke when I said that the book was forthcoming and Sarah corrected me properly. It actually came out um, well over a year ago from Stanford University Press. And I'd like Raya to share 
the screenshot of the Stanford University Press website so people can figure out um, where to find it if they'd like to order it. So Ryan, if you could do that, please, uh, that would be helpful. We also see that the book was honorable mention in the 2020 uh, uh, Association for Middle East Women's Studies Award. So that's quite good news. Here we go. So um, look at that website, buy this book. That's an, that's an order right there. You can see it's not, they forgot the exclamation mark over there on the side, buy this book. Uh, uh, it's excellent. And we're, we're quite pleased that, uh, that, that it's, it's fully out. I was reading an old text and so please forgive me for that. Okay, so I'm sure lots of questions out there. We already have some coming into the Q&A. If you have some questions for our speaker, please click on the Q&A button down there and, um, and fire away. And I've got some questions of my own, but I want to defer to our members first. We already have one from our student, Alejandro Gomez. Uh, which you've to some degree have answered, but I'd like to read it anyway. He says, was there any popular backlash in Iraq against the educational curricula proposed by American scholars? Um, in addition to perhaps uh, uh, the, the leadership, or there, was there popular resistance to it? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, first I'll say uh, just a, a little bit more about the non-popular resistance, sort of intellectual resistance. Right. Um, I mean, one of the more well-known, the, probably the most well-known was, was from Sati al who wrote, who was an Iraqi na Arab nationalist, but also Iraqi, I think Iraqi nationalist too, is, um, uh, partly, use, anyways, that's a different topic. Um, he, he was a, a, often called the, the father of Iraqi education. He was a director of Iraqi education in the 1920s. He was, he was really instrumental in creating the Iraqi education system as a, and the nationalist curriculum of the education system. Um, he was totally against the Monroe Report and wrote these really devastating um, critiques of it. Um, and he focused especially on um, the recommendation that rural boys should only be taught agricultural and manual um, labor skills. He really thought that um, all Iraqis should have the same education um, and they should all have a right to um, in, sort of intellectual uh, kind of education, in addition to learning, you know, future uh, uh, vocational um, skills. So he really pushed back in the Monroe Report. He considered it a continuation of colonial forms of thinking um, that just wanted to teach Iraqis manual labor, that wanted to avoid political unrest um, by not allowing them access to, um, to uh, critical thinking and to an intellectual form of education. Um, so he wrote some really important critiques of the Monroe Report. He was less critical of the recommendations of girls' education, um, but he did say girls should receive an intellectual education, they should learn sciences, it shouldn't just be home economics, but he did concede that, that more home economics was necessary. Um, the popular resistance is a really good question. It's a little harder to find, but yeah, there were, you know, you hear um, like in the Ministry of Education's journal and other uh, reports on the school system, um, you hear, you know, especially in this 1952, when the, when the um, FAO report um, happens, there is pushback on that, um, both in the press, um, but also anecdotally among students, that, that female students are pushing back on it. And, and actually, one of the arguments for doing it is they're saying female students are resistant to learning um, home economics and resistant to learning, um, you know, child raising and, um, and um, you know, home budgeting and, and cooking and cleaning. And one of the explicit contexts for bringing that 1952 FAO team was this concern about communism in the schools, including in the girls' schools. Um, so the Iraqi Communist Party was very popular among youth. Um, I interviewed a number of women who had been in the Communist Party when they were young. They were recruited in secondary school, um, and that's when they started being active in, in the party. Um, so this was a serious concern of, um, of the authorities, and one of and it was the argument was made all the time in, in the, um, the Ministry of Education journal that one reason we need to, to be teaching girls home economics is because they're out trying to overthrow the political system and joining the Communist Party. So there was, a, you know, the um, you know, often the initial projects were already a pushback against political unrest. And I argue that um, throughout the book. That's a really good question. Thank you. And it is hard to find, you know, really specific sources on the popular pushback outside of the kind of intellectual um, press-based pushback. Good. Thank you for that. We've got another question coming in from Sara Farhan, who says, in my research, in her research, I found that uh, conversations about co-education emerged when women were granted access into the local medical college in 1933. I'm wondering if you've come across anything in your research that predates 1933 regarding for, educational initiatives for women. Um, predating 1932. Um, 33. I mean, there's certainly, you know, there's certainly. Uh, yeah, there's certainly a lot of debates and discussion through the 1920s about expanding girls' education. Um, there are questions of whether uh, Satya al even though he's a modernizer and a promoter of women's rights, whether he's doing enough to expand um, girls' schools um, in particular. Um, 
co-education, I'm not familiar with the debates on co-education in particular about, about bringing girls and boys into the same schools in the 1920s, that I don't know. But there are certainly debates about expanding girls' education, about where we're gonna find female teachers and so on. Good, thank you for that. Other questions, please leave them in the Q&A. I'd like to ask a, a question related to, uh, oh, here's one coming in from Masha Kurosarova, uh, after member here in history. I mean, uh, enlarge this because it's a long question here, so I want to be able to read it. Okay, so can you please speak more about who invited the Monroe Commission in the first place and why they were invited in 1932? In the 1930s, Depression era, usually associated with isolationism in the US, whose idea was it to advise the Iraqi Ministry of Education and why Americans as opposed to say the British who were still in control in the region. Also, she would love to hear more about changes in educational programs after 1958's revolution and who or what ideas were driving those changes. Okay, there's a lot in that. Um, I'm not sure I can get to all of it, but, um, but those are great questions. Um, so who invited the Monroe um, Commission? So there was already, um, a split developing in the Iraqi education system um, that would become um, a really strong divide between Satya al-Hosri and some of his friends and um, this new cohort of um, American educated um, educators um, in Iraq. And in 1932, um, one of those who had become very important um, in the Iraqi education system, and he actually eventually became a prime minister, um, was uh, uh, Muhammad Jamali, who was a student at Columbia Teachers College in 1932, getting his PhD in education. Um, and so he is widely assumed to be the one who arranged this um, invitation, which came from the Hashemite monarchy, um, probably through El Jamali. And he was um, actually on the Monroe Commission. So he was the one Iraqi on the commission. He wrote the chapter of the Monroe Report on Bedouin education, which was the topic of his dissertation. Paul Monroe is his dissertation advisor. Okay, so that's probably the really direct um, connection. Um, eventually, Jamali and Hosri end up in a huge debate over the Monroe Report, especially, but and the recommendations um, within it. Um, and you know the whole future of Iraqi education um, system. And a few years later, Al-Husri leaves the Ministry of Education um, altogether and um, goes to the Ministry of Antiquities, um, which is related to this uh, dispute. So that's you know um, Columbia Teachers College. You know, in terms of American interventionism, um, Columbia Teachers College had a program for um, international students. It's the title of it's escaping me right now, but it was a program within Columbia Teachers College for international students. And Columbia Teachers College made agreements with governments around the world. Um, China was really big. There were a lot of Chinese students there. Iraq was big. There were quite a few Iraqi students there. So they made agreements with governments that they would send their students to Columbia Teachers College. And then the students um, signed agreements. They would go back and work for the Ministry of Education um, for a certain number of years. Um, Columbia Teachers College was explicitly training these students in um, um, projects, the projects that I talked about um, connected to the Hampton Institute. In fact, they would send, that, send them to the Hampton Institute for the summer and they would work with black youth you know, in the Hampton Institute and in these segregated schooling projects in order to bring those ideas and practices back to their home countries, Iraq or China or whatever. So you know, this wasn't an explicit, you know, um, I mean, it wasn't a US government initiative, but it was an education initiative um, that was, you know, um, not isolationist. It was about bringing, you know, already about bringing American education know-how to um, other countries. Paul Monroe, by the way, was on the, um, what was it called? The inquiry after World War I. Woodrow Wilson put him on the inquiry, which was in charge of um, evaluating the post-war settlements and trying to come up with a, va with a valid American role um, in the post-Ottoman world, in the post-war settlements after World War I. So Paul Monroe had been involved you know, with um, thinking about education in the Middle East, specifically in terms of America's role in the world um, since World War I, and even before he was involved in the Philippines and other things. So thinking about Americans' educational uh, mission um, to the rest of the world. Um, so I don't know if I'm gonna get to all these questions. Uh, the post, um, post-1958, um, uh, I mean, that's a long story too. Um, you know, home economics um, stays in Iraq. I couldn't, you know, because I wasn't really focused on um, home economics in particular in that time period. The, you know, the, um, the eventually the FAO and the UNESCO projects that I look at um, leave Iraq, they're there for, a, well, FAO leaves, UNESCO leaves earlier, FAO is there for a little bit and then they leave. Um, but home economics continues in Iraq through the decades. Um, you know, it doesn't, might even still be taught there. I'm actually not, not sure about that. Um, so I'm, I'm not gonna say more about that because I'll be making stuff up at this point. Um, but yeah, thank you. Uh, it's fascinating, thank you. There's another question in, but I just wanted to point out that when I was in middle school in the 1970s, uh, home economics was still taught in suburban Detroit. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if they still taught it, still taught it there. Um, so that this educational model, the racialized model, certainly didn't work for, in, to promote democracy in Iraq, but it also didn't work to promote it very well in the United States either. Um, 
There's a question from Homo Gupta, one of our, our humanities research fellows um, and also an expert on Iraq. She says, thank you for the talk. She's wondering if you could expand on the Monroe Commission's racialized recommendations regarding different curricula for different groups in Iraq. Which groups were identified and how did these proposed curricula differ? Were black Iraqis one of these groups or were they subsumed within other groups? And were any of these recommendations actually implemented? Yeah, um, so it was not actually in the Monroe report. It was a different um, project that was pushed by Mata Akrawi, who was um, another one of these guys who was educated at Columbia Teachers College and um, he finished um, after Jamali did. And he also became the Director General of Education in Iraq um, later on and then he went to work for UNESCO. Um, but he rec and so he was closely attached with you know this the circle of the Monroe the Monroe circle. I'm not sure if Monroe was his advisor too, but but possibly. Um, and uh, so he proposed five different public school curricula for Iraq for um, um, or, okay, let me get this right urban so it's for urban youth, um, rural Arab youth, rural Kurdish youth, and what are those three Ur urban rural Arab rural Kurdish. Bedouin, so Arab Bedouin, so, so peasant Arab and Bedouin Arab, and then girls, all girls, no matter where you were, would have one curriculum, and then the boys were differentiated according to, you know, race and, and, and location, urban versus rural um, location in Iraq. Um, that was not implemented, um, um, and, and Al-Husri was totally against it. He really uh, wrote a strong critique of that. Um, you know, I, I really talk about it in terms of um, this interesting uh, um, as one example of a way in which, you know, girls' education was imagined by these reformers as a homogeneous, while boys' education was increasingly differentiated. So those the sexual differentiation, but then girls' education was universal everywhere, you know, once you were on that side of the, the gender divide, whereas the boys' education was often imagined to be differentiated. And that there was other examples of that too that, that did at least get um, implemented temporarily, like in girls' schools, um, for a while, they just eliminated the literary and scientific tracks for girls, and um, all girls were required to study home economics and would have some joint literary and scientific training otherwise. Whereas in boys, they, they divided up literary and scientific into like four or six, I forget, total categories. So there were different ways of experimenting with those uh, projects. Um, but no, that was not, it was not directly implemented in that. So the racialized version of the American education system, you know, it didn't get implemented in any direct racial way in Iraq. I think the way it gets implemented is um, this differentiation between rural and urban schools. I mean, so they're really implementing it in terms of um, a social geographical location. If you're in a rural area, then this industrial education model taken from black schools in the South, then it applies uh, to you. Right. Can I ask a little follow-up question? Were there parallel private educational missions going on, for example, Protestant and other Christian or Jewish, or even the, the Kutab system, the Kutatib at the same time? Yeah, um, I don't. I didn't do research into sort of the gender, uh, the the you know feminine domesticity models in those places, which is the focus of this chapter in the the public schools. Um, but definitely, you know, I mean, home economics education is originally you know it's expanded around the world through Protestant missions in the 19th century. I mean, so so definitely in Iraq they would have been teaching that even in the 1920s, where um, when the national public education system was uniform for girls and boys you know i'm sure that in the protestant schools they were still teaching um, home economics uh, but i haven't actually done research on it um, myself but but the, but the private uh, religious schools you know were important were big in iraq and there were all kinds of debates in the 1920s about how and whether to incorporate them into the, the public school system the british were funding all of them including the muslim um, schools so the british were funding private religious schools that was a debate um also um yeah i'm gonna stop there instead of yeah right are there are other questions for our guest speaker here today. I have another one. I'm just wondering if you can talk about two things. One, the, the your sources and methods for this. Did you look at educational materials? I know you mentioned interviewing people. Um, what are just for our students and other faculty that might be interested in researching such a topic like this, which is fascinating. What what sort of methods did you use, and what sources were most important for you? And what sort of sources did you find important that you didn't expect to be important? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, yeah, I do talk about that in the introduction. You know, of course, Iraq um, was a challenging place to do um, research on. And when I was writing the, you know, most of the research I did when I was, this came out of my dissertation. So mostly I wrote it when I was working on my dissertation. Um, I didn't go to Iraq to do research. Um, I was, you know, it was during a, the US occupation. And I, I mean, really, I wouldn't have been interested politically in going to somewhere during a US occupation, even if I had had funding, which I couldn't have found anyways. Um, um, but I, you know, you know, as I say in the introduction, um, 
partly because there's just so few works on Iraq. <laughs> there's a lot of sources that are available outside um, the country that have not been accessed or that can be reinterpreted, that have not been interpreted in ways that, um, that stand up uh, very well, in my opinion. Um, so there's still a lot of work to be done on the sources that are available outside Iraq. And also, you know, a country that's been at war for 40 years, basically, I mean, almost continuous war for 40 years since the Iran-Iraq war in the 1980s, um, a lot of the sources are in exile too. You know, a lot of people are in exile and a lot of sources are in exile. So it, it took some traveling around, you know, Beirut, London, California. Um, I did do, I did research at the Hoover Institute, that was before the Bath Archives were there. It was, uh, it was research into the, um, you know, it was a Cold War Institute, American Cold War Institute. So they were collecting all the leftist periodicals in the 50s and 60s. So they had like a, you know, a complete collection of the communist newspapers. Um, so it took some traveling around to find the scattered uh, sources, but I did a lot of work in periodicals. Um, um, which again, you know, sometimes I'd have to go to multiple places just to find a complete collection of a, of a periodical. Um, uh, and then I ended up, you know, partly, um, you know, I'm not sure if, if I'd been able to go to Iraq, if I would have ended up focusing so much on the development expertise as I did, but I ended up doing, you know, work in development archives, like in Europe, in the um, UNESCO archives, for example, because UNESCO had this big land settlement project in Iraq where they were teaching peasant women home economics. Um, so that really got me thinking about um, this as a rural economic development project, um, which is very different from how, you know, gender history has worked in the Middle East. Most of it focuses on the interwar period and is looking at sort of the bourgeois nationalist discourses. After World War II, everything is about economic development. Everyone is making their arguments in terms of economic development. So looking at these development sources was really useful um, for that and probably the least expected in terms of my original plan. Um, and then, you know, I did a lot on interlibrary loan. I mean, you know, and um, I and I did, you know, some of the chapters are based on um, a single source, a single text broadly understood, like the epilogue is on the monument to freedom, but I'm also looking at Iraqi art criticism on that monument over the decades. Um, one uh, chapter is based on a law, the Iraqi personal status law in 1959. You know, we know very little about Iraqi legal history. These are sources that are available anywhere, the laws. Um, and, you know, to evaluate those and write histories of those is just wide open um, for people to work on. So I have one chapter that's on this Iraqi personal status law, which is a really major source of debate and conflict during the revolutionary era from 58 to 63. Many historians have said it was one of the factors behind the success of the first Ba'ath coup in 1963, because the Ba'athists were, even though they were secular nationalists, were able to get both the Shia and the Sunni religious authorities temporarily on their side against the Iraqi personal status law long enough to implement this coup. And then they you know, killed off all the communists and other leftists. And um, that was the beginning. Um, I mean, it's up and down. It's not the Ba'ath party the entire way through, but that's the beginning of that um, period of time. So, you know, people had attributed a lot of importance to this law, but no one had actually really looked at, very few people had actually looked at the law and the conflict over it. And I found a lot of surprises um, in, you know, I got really interested in critiques of the law, which I wasn't expecting to. There were some really interesting criticisms of the law. Um, and so, you know, looking, I mean, that chapter is not just the, it's not just one source, the law, it's the law plus all the public debates um, around it. Um, in the revolutionary era, also, I look at this conflict over a women's literacy project that communist women were running um, that, again, was a major source of debate in the in the revolutionary era. The Ba'athists were using it to criticize the communists, and then the government used it as the excuse for shutting down the communist newspaper, which was the widest circulating daily newspaper in Iraq during the revolutionary period. Mm -hmm. The government shut it down because of this conflict of communist women going into rural areas to teach women literacy. Nobody had talked about that. You know, it was all over the media, but just no one, I guess, had been interested. So there's a lot to do um, in Iraqi history um, without necessarily needing to go there. Um, now I really need to go there because I'm working on the 1920 revolt and there's archives in Najaf I really need to see. Um, but really writing the book, you know, I had plenty of sources, um, you know, outside Iraq. So really, you know, it depends on what you're doing, of course. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. That's great. And students take note, there's a lot more that can be done, especially particularly the legal history that uh, was just mentioned. Are there other questions? Type them in. Speak now or forever hold your peace. I have another question as well about your current work and your your next book project, which is a, um, um, a deviate. Not a, I won't say a deviation, but a movement away from some some of these issues, but also continuity from with some of the others. Want to talk a little bit about where you're headed? Sure, and that actually has changed since I wrote about it probably in my faculty page or wherever I've written about it. So originally, I wanted to write the second book. I mean, until recently, on. Um, uh, land settlement projects in Iraq and maybe comparative to other parts of the, the Middle East, uh, like Jordan and possibly Syria, um, specifically in relation to gender. So I have this chapter that looks at um, for the creation of family farms as kind of a way of settling um, uh, displaced uh, peasants, rural people into uh, under these fixed family farms instead of 
preventing them from running to the cities, right? And joining the Communist Party in the cities. Again, this was a you know really political um, project. Um, it ends up destroying the environment because they're they're based on these family farms that require intensive methods of agriculture. They don't create a drainage system, um, which means the land all turns to salt in 20 years. They knew that was going to happen from the beginning if they didn't implement a drainage system. It happened exactly as predicted. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking at the effects of this family farm model on um, ecology and on um, society. I mean, it was a social and ecological disaster. Also, a disease spread everywhere because the family farms were located one kilometer apart and they couldn't get clean water to them. And the settlers couldn't even build a well like they had back in their old villages because they were so far apart from each other. And because the water table was rising, it would just bring all the junk that was polluting them in the first place to the surface. So it was a disaster. Um, and yet uh, some development agencies, including the US.4, kept pushing for this isolated family farm model, even after this Dujela project, um, which was the, what's the term, which was the experiment, the, um, the experimental, the pilot project uh, for, for this uh, family farm model in this region. So some development agencies kept insisting on this family farm model. So I was interested in exploring that and following the future, the future history of that um, family farm model. Um, in an environment and a, a context where it seemed to be a complete um, disaster. So I wanted to bring family um, history into conversation with development and environmental history. Now that I've said all that, I'm actually not even doing that, um, I think. Um, I've gotten, uh, someone else could do that and I, have, I do have ideas about it. Um, I do make the argument you know, in that chapter, so I'm not sure I have a lot more to say about it. What I've gotten interested in is um, the 1920s. And uh, the chapter one of the book is on the mandate period it was not in the dissertation, it came later. I didn't really do a lot of primary research for it. It's really engagement with secondary scholarship. You know, I was trying to kind of lay, lay a context for the later part of the book. Um, but that chapter to me is the one that's bugging me. You know, I've opened a lot of questions that, that are not answered for me, that are, that are troubling me in different ways. Um, so I really am going back to Iraq's formation, you know, around 1920, the 1920 revolt, um, and situating that revolt in the context of some of this global 1919 scholarship, this wave of anti-colonial rebellion, you know, across Asia and Africa after World War I, connecting it to an earlier revolt in Iraq, the Najaf revolt of 1917-1918, and really trying to situate Iraq more within global and regional history in terms of anti-colonial rebellion. And then also look at the British response to those revolts um, and its influence on the whole legal architecture that they, the British created in the mandate system. So military law, criminal law, personal status law, how these different um, legal, um, this kind of pluralistic legal system worked to contain various forms of, um, of rebellion. So that's actually where I've been going um, in my current work, which is quite different from what I've been announcing on, in, on my website. <laughs> It'll be the third book then. <laughs> yeah, right. That sounds fascinating. And I hadn't heard this expression of global 1919, but uh, I just thought the 1919 Egyptian revolution in the class and just think, yeah, of course, it makes a lot of sense even in uh, thinking in terms of Syria and what was going on at the same time. So excellent. Are there other questions or comments? Students, speak up. Now's your turn. They're all busy eating their lunch, their virtual lunch. <laughs> Well, if there are no more questions, I want to again uh, thank you, Sarah, for joining us uh, and, and for participating from a distance. We wish we could have um, had you here with us in person, and we hope to be able to do that at some point in the not too distant future. And uh, so we'll be in touch with you about that. Um, notice to the speakers is that we will end the webinar immediately after the recording stops. So um, just, uh, just be patient. And again, a big round of virtual applause for you, Sarah, and thank you again for this extraordinary talk. Thank you everyone for coming. I know we're all busy and preoccupied with many things. So thanks, and thanks for inviting me.